This is TechBridge's Advanced Excel Workshop. TechBridge breaks the cycle of generational poverty through the innovative use of technology to transform nonprofit and community impact. We work in four pillars, hunger relief, homeless support, social justice, and workforce development. In our workforce development pillar, we work to close the digital equity gap with training and employment. Through our partnership with J.P. Morgan Chase, we're able to bring this advanced Excel training to universities and HBCUs around the country. So let's get started. Throughout our session today, what we're really trying to do is get to a place where we can create something like this. This is called a dashboard, and we'll talk a little bit later about what that is and what it means. But notice how that this is kind of telling a story. So that's what we're hoping to get to today. Before we can get there though, we do need to go over some key terminology to make sure that we're all on the same page. First, the work that we do in Excel is done in what we call a workbook. So the file that you downloaded, any Excel file really, is called a workbook. Each workbook contains one or more worksheets. And these worksheets can be found on the worksheet bar down across the bottom. And each worksheet has a name. You can click and change between worksheets. Each worksheet consists of individual cells. So the rectangles that make up a grid of each worksheet, those are called cells. Cells are named by column letters and row numbers. If we look across the top of our uh, grid area here, we can see the column letters, A, B, C, and so on. And down the left-hand side of the window, we can see the row numbers, one, two, three. Wherever we are in Excel is named by that column letter and row number. So right now I've clicked inside of cell C3. Each cell can contain numbers, formulas, or text. We can see here that we have some dates, some text, and some numbers. We'll get to formulas a little bit later. Worksheets also have an invisible drawing layer which hold charts, images, and diagrams. And this is really where we're gonna use the full power of Excel through visualizations. At any given time, one cell is the active cell indicated by the dark outline. So when I click inside of the cell, that dark outline follows, that's called my active cell. The name box displays the active cell address or the name of the selected range, cell, or object. So if I look above those column letters, underneath the clipboard group of my home tab on the ribbon, we'll talk about that, I'll see my name box. And this tells me exactly where I'm located, where that active cell is. So right now my active cell is inside of cell D5, and that's exactly right. As I click on another cell, the name inside of my name box changes to reflect my new active cell. The area at the top of the window with all of the commands is called the ribbon. This ribbon is made up of many different tabs. So we have the home tab, the insert tab, draw tab, page layout tab, and so on. On each tab, we have a lot of different buttons or commands. And this is how we perform some of the operations in Excel. If you're on a PC, you'll notice that you also have a file tab. This is where you can save, open a new document, open an existing document, print, and more. If you're running Mac OS, that file tab is not pre present here. Instead, it's on the menu bar on your OS. Feel free to pause, take a screenshot, and come back to this if there's ever anything I reference that you're not sure what it is. So the first major topic we're gonna go through is pivot tables. So what is a pivot table? How do we insert one? How do we format and modify them? And then how do we turn that into a visualization through pivot charts? So what is a pivot table? A pivot table is a dynamic summary report generated from a database, usually in the form of a table. Pivot tables are great because they're interactive. They allow us to rearrange the information in almost any way imaginable, 
insert special formulas that perform new calculations, and create groupings of summary items. In your workbook, the second sheet that you have is called bank data. Whenever we get a new set of data, it's really critical that we take a look at what information we're being given and start to formulate different questions and really see what we notice and what we wonder. So first I'll give you a little bit of background. This table consists of a month's worth of new account information for a three branch bank. The table contains 712 rows and each row represents a new account opened at that bank. We have a couple of columns here that give us information about the account that was opened. We have the date the account was open, the weekday that that date was, the amount or the money that was deposited into the account when it was opened, what type of account was opened, whether that be an IRA account, a CD, a checking account, or a savings account, who the account was opened by, whether that be just a normal teller or the new accounts manager, which branch the account was opened at, whether that be Central, North County, or West Side, and then whether the person that opened the account was a new or existing customer. As you look at this data, questions should start forming in your mind. What do you notice? What do you wonder? I'd like to encourage you to pause the video, take a few minutes to look at the data, and jot down a few quick questions. So some of the questions that I see when I look at this data set are, what is the daily total new deposit amount for each branch? Which day of the week accounts for the most deposits? How many accounts were opened at each branch, broken down by account type? How much money was used to open the accounts? What types of accounts do tellers open most often? In which branch do tellers open the most checking accounts for new customers? So as you can see, these questions range from pretty general to really specific. That last question there has a lot of qualifiers and we know exactly the piece of information we're looking for. The good news is that all of these questions can be answered using pivot tables. So let's take a minute to talk about how to insert a pivot table and then we'll get back to those questions. To create a pivot table manually, we'll select any cell in our range and then on our ribbon, we'll go to the insert tab, we'll find the tables group, and then we'll choose the pivot table command. Looks like this. So on our ribbon, we'll find the insert tab. On the far left hand side, you may have a drop down for the table group, or if your window is big enough, they may just show up all next to each other like this. We'll select the pivot table button. That'll bring up the create pivot table dialog box, where we'll specify a location for the pivot table. Once that's done, we'll be able to set up the layout of our pivot table. So let's go through it together. Select any cell within your range. On your ribbon, find the insert tab. On the left-hand side, you may see a tables dropdown if your window is a little bit smaller. If not, you may just see the pivot table button. If you have the dropdown, click it, you'll see that pivot table button there as well. Click the pivot table button and you'll get the create pivot table dialog box. The top half of the box is asking us to select the table or range. Now, because our active cell was inside of our table range, Excel is smart enough to know that we wanted that entire table. On the bottom half of this create pivot table dialog box, Excel is asking us where we wanna place the pivot table. We can choose to place it on a new worksheet or an existing worksheet. For now, let's place it on a new worksheet. Make sure that's selected and I'll click OK. Once you click OK, Excel will create a new worksheet. Mine is called Sheet 1 and yours will probably will be called Sheet 1 as well. And then it inserts a pivot table. If this is the first pivot table in your worksheet, it would be called Pivot Table 1. But as this has been set up ahead of time, this is Pivot Table 20. On the right-hand side of your window, you should see a pivot table fields pane over here on the right. In the top half of that box, you'll see all of the columns from your original data set, and those are called fields. 
what we can do is we can drag and drop any of these fields into any of these four categories, filters, columns, rows, and values. I encourage you to take a minute to just drag and drop and see what happens to your table. As you can see, as I move things around, my table changes. Once you've played around a little bit, go ahead and click each of the values inside of these and drag them out to make them go away. You can also right click and remove field. So we'll start with a fresh pivot table. So here again, we can drag those field names. You can also use the check boxes if you'd like. Just be careful when you use those check boxes. Excel will put each of the fields where it thinks they should go. Sometimes it's right, sometimes it's not, and you may have to drag and fix. So let's create a pivot table together. The first step, we're going to drag the amount field into the values area. The values area will generally, generally be our numeric data. So amount, drag into values. When I drag amount to values, I can see my pivot table change. Right now it reads 6,611,959. This represents the total amount of money that was used to open all of the accounts. That's pretty interesting, but let's get a little bit more information on a little bit more of a granular view. Let's drag the account type field into the rows area. So I'll find account type, I'll drag it to the rows. When I do that, that 6 million gets split into my four different types of accounts. And I can immediately start to get a picture of what type of account has the most money in them and which type of account contains the least amount of money. We can also drag fields into our brand, into our columns area to get an even more granular view of the data. So let's drag the branch field into the columns area. Now I can see at each branch how much money was deposited into each type of account. So as you can see, the more that I add to these pivot table field areas, the more specific of a picture I get. Now, when you look at this, maybe this is okay for you, but the goal when you're representing data in tables is to make the story as clear as possible. So I think we can make this a little bit more clear or a little clearer by formatting these numbers, maybe with some commas. To do that, we're gonna right click any cell in the pivot table that has a number value and choose the number format option. So I will right click, go to the number format option. It'll give me a bunch of categories. The default is general. We know that these are dollar amounts, so let's change it to a currency. Currencies automatically put commas as those placeholders. Because all of these are whole numbers, we don't really need any decimal places, so I can decrease that to zero. And you can choose to leave the dollar sign or take it away. Since all of these are dollar values, we may not need it, but if you wanna keep it, you can. So then we'll click OK. And now we can really see which of these values are in the millions and which are in the hundreds or tens of thousands. We can format and modify our pivot tables. And that's one of the great things about them. We don't have to you know, stick with what we did at first. We can always change it. So one thing I do wanna show you very quickly, if you exit out of this pivot table fields pane using the X, and then you click out and click back in, that, that window no longer pops up. If that happens to you, it's okay. Just right click a cell inside of your pivot table and show the field list. When our active cell is inside of our pivot table, you should see two contextual tabs pop up, a pivot table analyze tab, and a design tab. The pivot table analyze tab has a lot of really specific uh, functions and commands. We won't really go too much into those today. 
you go to the design tab, this is where you can control these grand totals. So if you find the grand totals drop down, you can turn that off for rows and columns. You can turn it on for both or on for either rows or columns. So depending on the story you're trying to tell, that may be a helpful thing for you to control. This is also where you can control the style of your pivot table. One thing I always encourage uh, students to do is ensure that you're not you know, hiding the data with your data table. So just make sure that it's formatted in a nice way. So maybe not this, this is kind of difficult to read. Um, so just choose something that you know will be easy for your audience to follow. After we create our pivot table, changing it is easy. We use the pivot table fields task pane. We can remove fields. There's a couple of ways to do it. As I showed earlier, you can click and drag just out into the open here. Put that back. You can also right click the fields inside of um, your pane over here and you can remove it. So now it's time for us to revisit those questions from earlier. Now, the way this is gonna work, we're gonna go through each question and I encourage you to try it on your own first. So once I read the question, pause the video, take a couple of moments to try to create the pivot table yourself, and then start the video again to see the solution. So our first question is, what is the daily total new deposit amount for each branch? So go ahead and pause and see if you can try this on your own. So let me walk you through my thought process. When I'm answering questions using pivot tables, I look for keywords. So when I read this question, I see three keywords or phrases. The first is daily. The second is total deposit amount. And the third is each branch. So we're gonna use those three keywords or phrases to create our pivot table. So I wanna keep this pivot table here just so that I can keep track of what I'm doing. So I'm actually gonna insert a new pivot table to do this. So I'll go to my bank data sheet. I'll insert a pivot table. Now this time, instead of inserting our pivot table on a new worksheet, let's insert it on an existing worksheet, the one we were already working on before. So I'll select the existing worksheet option. And then my cursor is inside of this table range box. Excel is asking me where I wanna put my new pivot table. So I'm going to navigate to sheet one. And I'm gonna click a cell either below or to the right of my existing pivot table. Just be careful. You wanna make sure that you leave enough space between pivot tables so that things don't overlap. Once you've clicked on the cell that you wanna put your pivot table, click okay. So daily, total deposit amount, branch. So out of those three, amount is really gonna be our value, total deposit amount. I need to break that down across days, daily, and that's gonna be my date field. Because it was the first thing mentioned in our question, I'm gonna put that in my rows area. Then the last keyword mentioned in my question is branch. I need to break this down across branch as well as date. So I'm gonna take branch and put it into my columns area. This allows me to see how much money was deposited at each branch on each day. So for example, on April 2nd, $7,188 were deposited at the West Side branch. Don't forget to format your numbers just to make sure everything is easily readable. Question number two, which day of the week accounts for the most deposits? So let's insert a new pivot table. Insert pivot table. We're gonna do this a lot, so hopefully you'll get comfortable with it. I'm gonna scroll down and insert. Which day of the week, that's weekday, 
most deposits. So I'll put amount over here. Now you may be asking yourself, hmm, is that really what most deposits means? This is certainly showing us which day of the week accounts for the most amount of money deposited. But what about the number of deposits? In order to get that type of information, we need to change this from a sum to another summary. Pivot table data is most frequently summarized using that sum. It's kind of the default. To use a different summary technique, there are two ways to get to it. We can follow this, but I'll show you a faster way as well. So the first way is inside of your pivot table fields pane over here on the right, you can right click the values field and go to field settings. That'll bring up this pivot table field dialog box where we can change how we're summarizing the data. The faster way to do it is to right click any value inside of your pivot table, find the option that says summarize values by, and then you can see those same options. So we're gonna change this to a count. So how do you know when to use a sum versus a count? Count answers the question of how many, and sum answers the question of how much. So that's a general guideline you can use. So from this, we can see exactly which day of the week accounts for the most deposits, and that would be Friday. We can also see which day of the week accounts for the least deposits. That would be Saturday. Notice that Sunday isn't on this list, and that's because Sunday wasn't a date in the original data set because banks are closed on Sundays. Next question. How many accounts were opened at each branch broken down by account type? Just inserting a new pivot table. All right, how many accounts, that's gonna be a count, were opened at each branch, broken down by account type. So my three keywords are how many accounts, branch, and account type. So I know I need branch, I know I need account type, and I know I need a count of the amount. So I'm gonna change this sum to account. Now you may ask, is it okay to have branch in columns and account type in rows? Absolutely, you'll get the same numbers, right? The same data. However, in data in general, in Excel, when you're asking a question, there's generally a main focus. And here I read the main focus to be the branch. So generally we'll put that main focus in rows and then a secondary focus in the columns. Again, we have branch in rows, account type in columns, and the count of amount in our values. Next question. We've got two more. What types of accounts do tellers open the most often? Just inserting a new pivot table. So my keywords here are what type of account, tellers, and most often. So type of account seems to be the focus. Most often would imply that it's the highest number. So that's gonna be a count of amount. Now for the last part, tellers, that's a option for the opened by field. So I'll put opened by into columns. Now we certainly can answer this question. What types of accounts do tellers open most often? And that's checking accounts with 99. However, we have some extra information here in this table that we don't need. The totals, of course, but also new accounts. This question doesn't give any indication that I care about the new accounts. So we need to get rid of them. 
whenever there is something in one of our fields that we really don't care about seeing and we just want to see one portion, instead of making that a column, we can change it to a filter. So I'm going to take opened by out of columns and drag it to filters. When I do that, this row is created above my pivot table. Right now it says opened by and then all in parentheses. If I click the drop down button, it gives me options to unselect any of the options that I have here. So I'm going to unselect new accounts. Now my pivot table is only showing me the data for tellers, which is the only data I needed. One other thing I want to show you is that if you ever want to see percentages, so relative percentages, we can get that as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to take amount and we're going to drag it to values for a second time. I'm going to go ahead and change this to account. And what we can also do is we can right click, show values as, and we can choose, the default is no calculation, but we can choose to show it as a percent of the grand total. This is just another way that you can help to tell the story. Sometimes seeing the relative percentages is more powerful than just seeing the raw data. Here's our last question. In which branch do tellers open the most checking accounts for new customers? I'll insert a new pivot table. Hopefully you're getting really good at that by now. So in which branch? I know that branch seems to be the focus, so I'll take branch and drag it to rows. I'm looking for the most, so I know that that's gonna be a count. Count of amount. So let's change that. Now, for the other keywords in this question, we have tellers, checking accounts, new customers. And these are all specific options for opened by, account type, and customer. So instead of putting these in rows or columns, I'm actually gonna use three filters. I'm gonna use account type as a filter, opened by as a filter, and customer as a filter. I'll change the account type filter to checking only. I'll change the open by filter to teller only. And I'll change the customer field filter to new only. So the answer to the question, in which branch do tellers open the most checking accounts for new customers? That answer would be central. The last thing I want to show you here is how to insert pivot charts. Pivot charts are graphical representations of the data summary displayed in a pivot table. Any Excel charting features that you know, either from last class or from any of your use in Excel, you know, bar charts, column charts, line charts, pie charts, all of those are available as pivot charts. Excel provides a lot of different ways to create a pivot chart. You can go from the Pivot Table Tools Analyze tab on your ribbon. You can go from the Insert tab on your ribbon, and then there's a, a variety of options there as well. So I'll show you kind of my favorite. If you'd like to go through these other options, you are more than welcome to. So I'm going to go ahead and use this, the last example we did from the last section. So I'm going to click any cell inside of my Pivot Table. On the ribbon, I'll go to the Insert tab. Once I'm on the Insert tab, you should see a group called Charts. Depending on which operating system you're running and what version of Excel you have, you may see a Pivot Chart button. If you don't see it, it is OK. There's nothing magical about that Pivot Chart button. Any chart that you insert, as long as you have your cell selected in your Pivot Table, it'll be a Pivot Chart. So I'm actually, I know that this is just three categories. I want to compare them with each other, parts to a whole. So I think a pie chart is going to be best for that. 
So I'm going to find my pie chart command. I'm going to insert a 2D pie chart. You can change the title by double clicking it. So this would be the checking accounts opened by tellers for new customers. That's, that's it, we've got our, our pivot chart inserted. One thing to know about pivot charts is that pivot tables and pivot charts are joined in a two-way link. So when I click on this pivot chart, if I change any of these fields, for example, I pull weekday over here, that will change the underlying table and the chart on top of it. In the same way, if I have my table and I change any of these fields, it will change the chart that's connected to it. When you activate the pivot chart, the pivot table fields pane will change to the pivot chart fields pane. Pivot chart fields, pivot table fields. The field buttons are the same controls, you know, they, they, they are interchangeable. If we have a pivot chart linked to a pivot table and we delete the underlying pivot table, the pivot chart will remain. So when I have my pivot chart selected, you should see a contextual tab called pivot chart analyze. If I were to delete this pivot table, I just press the delete key on my keyboard. Notice that I still have the chart, it didn't go away. But now when I click on it, it doesn't say pivot chart design or analyze, it just says chart design. So when you delete the pivot table, you still keep the chart, but it's just a regular chart now. And by default, when we have a pivot table and create a pivot chart, that pivot chart will be embedded in the same sheet. So what I'd like you to take a few moments to do, pause the video, and before you go on to the next section, take a look at the pivot exercise tab on your workbook. And I'd like you to create a pivot table and a pivot chart. The chart that you create should reveal something about the data, a trend or a relationship. Don't feel like you have to use all of the columns, just focus on one aspect. Feel free to change the layout and style, but just make sure that your chart conveys a message. There aren't really any right or wrong answers to this section. It's really just about you exploring and getting comfortable with how to insert a pivot table and the pivot chart that goes with it. Our next section out of three will go through kind of the other side of Excel. So we've done this data analytics through pivot tables and pivot charts, but we can also analyze and perform calculations through what we call formulas and functions. So we're gonna take a look at generally what those are and go into a couple of more advanced functions. So think for a minute about what functions you know already exist in Excel. Maybe you know a couple, maybe you don't know any at all. So what is a formula? A formula is a special code that we enter into the cells. They perform some type of calculation and return a result that's displayed. So you can kind of think of it as a kind of really complex calculator. Formulas always begin with an equal sign and they can contain mathematical operators like plus, minus, multiplication, division, and exponents. We can use cell references, values, text, or other worksheet functions. And it is important to note that Excel will always follow the mathematical order of operations. So if you have things in parentheses, those will be solved first, then exponents, then it, multiplication and division from left to right, then addition and subtraction from left to right. So really the way that a calculator would complete the calculation is the way that Excel will complete the calculation. A function is a predefined formula. These function, functions enable us to greatly enhance the power of our formulas and perform calculations that are difficult or even impossible if we only use mathematical operators. 
So let's see an example of the difference between a formula and a function and why functions are so critical when we're using Excel. Go ahead and navigate to the function sheet of your workbook. And you can see we have 10 test scores in column A. Our goal will be to find the average of these 10 test scores in two different ways. The first is using mathematical operations. So how do we find the average of 10 numbers, just in general mathematically, if we were to type it into a calculator? Hopefully we know that to find the average of 10 numbers, we would add them all up and then divide by the number that we have, which is 10. So in cell C3, we're gonna use a formula to find the average. So all formulas start with an equal sign. Now I know I need to add up all the numbers and then divide by 10. So I'm gonna use parentheses to help me out here. So first I need to add the value in cell A2. So I'm gonna click on A2, that's called a cell reference. Then I'm gonna add by typing plus, and I'm gonna click on cell A3. And then I'm gonna add cell A4. And you can type it as well, you don't have to click. Plus A5, plus A6. And it doesn't have to be capitals, you can do lowercase a's, that's fine. Plus A9, plus A10, plus A11. So I've added all of those together, I'll close my parentheses. And then I wanna tell Excel to divide all of that by 10. So I'll type forward slash 10. Once you're done typing in the formula, press enter and Excel will return the value, which is 74. If your active cell is on cell C3 and you click inside of what's called the formula bar up here, Excel will highlight the cells that you're using. You can press escape to get out of that. So that's the first way using mathematical operators or operations. Hopefully you can see that this is a little bit tedious and we only had 10 scores. Think about what would happen if you had 100 scores or even more. So the creators of Excel, whoever coded it said, all right, we need to come up with a way that makes this easy to do for large sets of data. So they created the average function. So functions start exactly the same way as formulas. They are special types of formulas. So we'll start with an equal sign. Functions then, instead of just jumping right into mathematical operations, we have to type in the function name. So I know that the function name for average is average. So I'm gonna start typing average. When I do that, Excel starts suggesting some functions that I may use. So I see average right here. I'm gonna double click on it. Oops, I'll backspace, backspace. Excel will finish the name of the function and it'll insert an open parentheses. And this is how all functions start. The name of the function followed by an open parentheses. So now I need to select the numbers I wanna take the average of. And the great thing about functions is I don't have to click on the cells one at a time. Instead, I can select the entire range. So I just clicked on the first cell and while keeping my mouse clicked, I pulled down all the way to A11. You can also type in directly A2 colon A11. I'll close my function and I'll press the enter or return key. And I get the same answer I got when I used mathematical operations. Which one was faster? Definitely function. And especially if we get more and more values that we're taking the average of, that function becomes really indispensable. Here are some other basic functions. We can take the sum of a list of numbers, the average, which we just did. We can find the standard deviation, the count, something called count A. There is an if function. We won't touch on that today, but wanted, you to, wanted to make you aware that it was in Excel, we can also find the maximum and minimum. Before we do that, I wanna show you something really, really great about Excel. <coughs> 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 
on your ribbon, if you find the data tab, On your ribbon, if you find the formulas tab, you have drop downs for every function that exists in Excel. You could search through each one, but Excel also has an insert function command. When you click that insert function command, it's going to pull up a formula builder. It'll have your most recently used functions at the top, but we can also start searching for different functions. So let's start searching for some. I typed in SU and it gave me all of the functions that start with SU. So let's see, what is sum? So what does it do? It adds all of the numbers in a range of cells. What is our syntax? So what's the name of the function and what goes inside of those parentheses? Anytime there's a function you're not sure what it is or what it does, feel free to use this formula builder to help you out. So I'm gonna go ahead and type in directly. Feel free to pause and try on your own first. Equals sum parentheses A2 to A11. You should get 740. Standard deviation, S equals STDEV. And there are a couple options here. If you're a statistician or really into statistics, um, definitely something you can look into, but we're going to use dot s and that's for samples. If math isn't really your thing, you don't really care too much, don't worry about it for now, but we're going to use standard deviation dot s. We'll select our values, a2 to a11. You should get 20.575 approximately. For count, Let's find the count and let's actually include cell A1. I wanna show you something interesting. So if I find the count of A1 to A11, I get 10. Let's find the count A of A1 to A11 as well. We get 11. So you might ask yourself, what is the difference between count and count A? We can use our formula builder to help us answer that question. When I look at count, it says that count counts the number of cells in a range that contain numbers. So when I selected A1 to A11, although A1 was included, it doesn't contain a number. So Excel started at A2 and counted all of the cells with numbers, which is 10. Count A, on the other hand, counts the number of cells in a range that are not empty. So because A1 is not empty, that gets counted in count A, which is why we have 11. Max is equals max A2 to A11. Should get 98. And min will find equals min of A2 colon A11. And again, feel free to use your mouse, feel free to use your keyboard, whatever you're most comfortable with. You should get 29 as your minimum. So those were a couple of pretty simple examples of functions. But we're gonna take the next little bit to look through what we call conditional analysis functions. Conditional analysis functions or conditional calculations allow us to add up or average up or count up things based on a criteria. So let's say I had you know, a basket of fruit and I only wanted to count the fruit if it was red. So I would go through the basket and I would count up the strawberries and the apples, but I wouldn't count the oranges. And I can tell Excel to do that kind of thing as well. Now it's more number-based, of course, um, but that's the general idea here. The first conditional analysis function we're gonna look at is SUMIF. This will allow us to sum all the values that meet a certain condition. This has three inputs, otherwise known as arguments. So the first input or argument is the range, the second is the criteria, and the third is the sum range. I like to think about this backwards. So first I think, what will I be adding together? That's gonna go in sum range. What will I look for to be true? That's what will go in criteria. And where will I look for that criteria? 
that's what will go into my range. So I kind of start at the end and work my way forward. So let's illustrate this with an example. In your workbook, navigate to the sum if sheet. Here we have a budget and we're trying to determine if this budget is balanced or not. In order to determine if the budget is balanced, we can add up the negative balances, add up the positive balances and see if they're equivalent, just one positive, one negative. If they are, then they zero out and we have a balanced budget. So I'm gonna work backwards. What are we gonna add together? Well, we wanna add the balances together, of course. So that'll be my sum range. Criteria, what will I look for? Well, I'm gonna look for the negative values. I can't just type in negative values. I need to come up with a mathematical way to tell Excel which values are negative. The definition of a negative number, of course, is that that number is less than zero. So that's gonna be my criteria. And where am I going to look to see if the number is less than zero? And the answer is again, the balance. So let's go ahead and type our function. Equals sum if. The range is our balance because this is where we're gonna look, comma, to see if the number is less than zero. And the way that we tell Excel to do that is we use quotation marks, we type the less than symbol, a zero, and then we close our quotation marks. Then we type a comma. If anything in this range is less than zero, what do we want to add up? And that's just C3 to C12. Close your function, press enter, and you should get $31,425 in parentheses, which means that it's a negative number. Now I do want to let you know, don't let this confuse you, but if your sum range and your range are the same, you can type this exact same formula and just leave off the sum range. If that's confusing to you, please feel free to leave it there. Either way, we'll give you the right answer. So take a moment and see if you can write a function for the positive balances, the sum of those. Hopefully you can see that the only thing that will change is the criteria. So equals sum if, my range is C3 to C12 still. My criteria for positive balances is greater than zero in quotation marks, comma, and my sum range, either I can leave it off or I can put C3 to C12 again. I'll press enter, I get $31,425 positive. So because my positive balances equal my negative balances, so that when I add them together, I get zero. This is a balanced budget. The next conditional calculation we'll perform is count if. This will allow us to get a count of values that meet a certain condition. So navigate to the count if sheet, and let's take a look at what we've got. In this table, we have a list of several countries across several years. And for each year and country, we have their GDP, gross domestic product. What we wanna do inside of cell G5 is we want to count up all of the instances where the GDP is greater than or equal to 1 million. Notice that for count if there are only two inputs or arguments, the range and the criteria. So where will I look and what will I look for? I know that what I'm looking for is for the number to be greater than or equal to 1 million. And where will I look for that? Well, I'm gonna look for it in my GDP. So let's type our formula. Equals count if, open parentheses. I need my range. So I'm gonna click inside of cell D3 and then I'm gonna use a keyboard shortcut. If you're on a PC, you're gonna click, use your keyboard. You're going to press shift, control, and then press the down key. If you're on a Mac, it's the same. It's just shift, command, down key. So here we go. Shift, command, down. 
That takes me all the way to the bottom of this list of values. Then I'll type a comma. I'm gonna scroll back up. And then I need my criteria. So again, in quotes, I want all of the numbers that are greater than or equal to one million. Oh, and don't forget to close your quotes and then close your parentheses. We'll press enter and you should get 96. And I will pull, you don't have to do this. I'll pull this up so that you can see that is the formula that I have typed in that cell. The last conditional calculation we're going to perform is average if. This will allow us to get the average of all numbers that meet a certain condition. Navigate to the average if sheet. So here we have some Olympics results for the Winter Olympics. We have our events, the athlete that competed, what country they were from. So we have SUI, that's Switzerland, AUT, I believe that's Austria, ESP, España, that's Spain, ITA is Italy, USA is of course the United States, France is FRA. So our goal, Oh, we also have their result, so how long it took them, and then their medal, gold, silver, or bronze. So our goal is going to put inside of I-5 the average result for everyone from the country in cell I-3. So right now, the country in cell I-3 is SUI, but that's pretty irrelevant. I could make that USA, I could make it AUT, ESP, whichever of the countries is included. So notice again, we have three arguments, the range, the criteria, and the average range. So again, I'm gonna think about this backwards first. So first I'll think of what is the average range? What will I average together? And the answer is result. I wanna to average together the results. For who do I wanna to average together the results? Well, that'll be everyone who belongs to this country inside of cell I3. And where will I look for that? Well, I'm gonna look inside of the country column. So that'll be my range. So let's go ahead and type our function in cell I5. Equals average if, I said my range was country, D3 to D20. Inside of that column in that range, I'm gonna look for everything that matches the country in the orange box in cell I3. Now I could type, SUI in quotes, but I wanna make this dynamic. So I'm gonna actually use a cell reference. I'm gonna click on cell I3 as my criteria, comma. Then my average range. If it matches, what will I average together? And that's those results, E3 to E20. Close my parentheses and press enter. You should get two minutes and 12 seconds. Let me get this for you so you can see. So there's my function. Now watch the really cool thing. Because I called this cell reference I3, if I change what's in cell I3 and press enter, look at what happens to the average result. It changes as well. So as I type in all of the different countries, I can see what all of their average results were. Pretty cool. So what I'd like you to do is take a look at exercise two. In exercise two, we have a table here in columns F through H of several people, their names, their gender, and how much they paid for their hospital bill. Our goal is to find the total of the hospital bills the average of the hospital bills and the count of the hospital bills, but split along gender. So in this first row, in row two, I wanna get only the males. And in row three, I wanna average sum and count only the females. So go ahead and pause the video, take a couple of moments, see if you can write those functions and fill in all six boxes that I have highlighted in yellow. So 
hopefully you've taken some time to try on your own. Let's walk through it. To find the total, we're going to use equal sum if. Now I'm going to think about it backwards. Sum range, my last input, what will I sum together? Well, that's going to be hospital bills. For who do I want to sum up the hospital bills? That's going to be males. And where do I have to look for that? In the gender column. So now let's put it in reverse. Where am I looking? In the gender column, G2 to G12, comma. What am I looking for? I'm looking for all of the Ms. So I'm going to put M in quotes, comma. If it matches, what will I sum my hospital bills? H2 to H12. Press enter, you should get 1,245. We can do the same thing for female, but our criteria will be F in quotation marks. So equals sum if G2 to G12, comma, F in quotes, and then my sum range is H2 to H12. You should get 655. For average hospital bill equals average if, and it's actually the same exact inputs as total hospital bills, our function just changes. So our range is again, gender G2 to G12. My criteria is M in quotation marks, and my average range is H2 to H12 again. Your results should be 207.5. And I'll do the same for a female. Average if, G2 to G12, F in, parent, or in quotes, and then H2 to H12 as my average range. You should get 131. Now, finally, for count, this is the one that tends to trip people up, up the most. So equals count if. I'm going to look in my gender column as my range, G2 to G12, and I'm just looking for all of the Ms. That only has two inputs. You don't have to do anything with hospital bill here. Should get six. Do the same for female. I'll select my gender, G2 to G12, and put F in quotes as my criteria, and I get five. Really quickly, I wanna to touch on conditional formatting. Conditional formatting is based on rules. So what it does is it allows us to highlight certain cells based on certain conditions. So to create a new rule, we're gonna to go to the Home tab on the ribbon, find the conditional formatting dropdown. And there are a lot of different options. We're not gonna go through all of them, but I just wanna show you where it is and show you a couple of quick tips. So let's actually highlight the gender, let's do hospital bill. So go ahead and highlight the hospital bill column. On our home tab, find the conditional formatting dropdown. When you click it, you'll see a lot of options. We have highlight cells rules, top and bottom rules, data bars, color scales, icon sets, and then new rules. New rule is kind of, if you already know what you're doing, you can use that. If you're not really sure what you're doing, you can look at the highlight cells rules. So maybe I wanna highlight everything above $100 in green or red. So I'm gonna choose the greater than option. So if any number or if any cell has a number that's greater than, let's go with 200, I'm gonna highlight that in red because maybe that's a kind of expensive bill. If you click this drop down, there are other options to highlight in different colors. And you can also click custom format to really control exactly what color and what pattern it looks like. Let's just stick for a light red fill for now. So notice in that hospital bill section, now all of the bills that were greater than $200 are now in red. We can add more. Let's say that everything less than $100, we wanna color that in green, that's a pretty cheap bill. So less than $100, we wanna color that in green. So there we have that. 
So those are one option. You can kind of highlight and fill different cells depending on their values. One thing that I really like is the color scales. If you click on one of the color scale options, what it's done is it's colored the lowest bill in red and the highest bill in green. Maybe that doesn't make sense. Well, if I'm the hospital, that would make sense, right? If you're the hospital, you want the most money you can get. But maybe from the patient point of view, I wanna flip the color scale so that the highest bill is in dark red, and the lowest bill is in dark green, and everything else fills in. So as you're working in Excel, I encourage you to play with some conditional formatting, use it when it's appropriate. It's not always appropriate, I'll warn you, but again, just something that you can use to help you tell that story. Let's go into cell references. So we've called cell references a couple of times. We've used I3 inside of a formula. In Excel, our references that we use by default are called relative references. The reason that they're called relative references is because they change when we copy the formula to another cell because the references are actually offsets from the current row and column. So I wanna illustrate this. Go ahead and click inside of cell F15 on your exercise two sheet. And let's type equals F1. Notice that when I type equals F1, cell F1 is highlighted. When I press enter, I get exactly what was in cell F1, which is name. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna copy this cell. So I used my keyboard shortcut, control or command C, and I'm gonna paste it in cell F16. So right below, you can use your keyboard shortcut, control or command V. Let's see what happens. I get a med. So although I copied a cell that looked like it said name, when I pasted it, I got a cell that says a med. Let's paste another below, paste paste. What's happening? Let's go up to name and paste, some, paste that, still, that same cell to the right. Gender, M, M, F, M. Let's paste again to the right, hospitable. So it looks like it's just recreating the table from above. When I copy and paste a cell that has a cell reference, as I move and paste, the cell reference moves as well. That's called a relative reference. Well, maybe we don't want that to happen, right? I wanna keep calling the same cell. What we can do is to make sure that the row and column references don't change when we copy the formula, we can use an absolute reference. And the way that we indicate an absolute reference is with dollar signs. So we put a dollar sign in front of the column and a dollar sign in front of the row. So let's do the same thing. Let's do it maybe off to the side. So I'm in cell J2. Let's do J1. I'm going to type equals. And this time, instead of F1, I'm going to do dollar sign F dollar sign one. It's still got cell F1 highlighted. I'll press enter. Now, when I copy cell J1 down below, paste, I get name, name. So notice that it's not moving the cell reference. It's continuing to call cell F1 because I made it absolute by fixing the row in the column with those dollar signs. So let's see an example of, of when we might care about this. So here we have a really simple um, kind of checkout sheet if you were shopping at a furniture store. Now, depending on wh where you're located, the sales tax might be more or less, but let's go ahead and say that the sales tax is 7.0%. Let's just fill that in right away. So first, our goal is going to be to fill in only row two, and we want to copy and paste it down below. We don't want to have to type it into every row. So let's see what we can do. To find the subtotal for chairs, we need to multiply quantity and price. So I'm gonna put equals. I'm gonna click on the quantity cell, which is B2. I'm gonna multiply it, that's the asterisk. 
buy sell C2, quantity times price. I'll press enter, I get 500. I can copy this down into the cells below. I can either copy and paste, or if you see this little tiny black box in the right lower right-hand corner of the active cell, if you put your mouse over it, your cursor will change. You can click it and drag down and let go and Excel will automatically fill in and copy and paste below. So let's click in each cell and make sure that the formula is correct. B3 times C3, okay, that's exactly what we wanted. B4 times C4, excellent. So the fact that these references are moving down as I move down is really great here because I, I want that to happen. So now let's try sales tax. To find sales tax, we need to multiply the subtotal by the sales tax. So I'm gonna type equals subtotal times my sales tax. So I have equals D2 times B6. I'll press enter and I get 35. Now, if I fill this down below, let's see what happens. I get zeros and that doesn't really make a lot of sense for sales tax. So let's click inside of cell E3 and click inside of our formula bar to see what's happening. When I copied what was in cell E2 into E3, the references all moved down one. So it was great that D2 moved down to D3, but B6 also moved down to B7. I didn't want that to happen. So what I can do is I can fix B6. So let's go back to cell E2. And for B6, let's put dollar signs in front of the B and in front of the six. This will create an absolute reference so that that B6 will not move down as I move down. So now let's use our fill handle, click and drag down. Now it's calculating sales tax correctly. And then to find our total, we'll add the subtotal and the sales tax. So equals subtotal plus sales tax. Press enter, click your fill handle and drag down. And these should be your answers. A good practice is to take these cells that have money in them, right? Currency, and we'll change our number format. We'll go to format cells and we'll format them as currency with two decimal places. There you go. So hopefully this helps you see the difference between why we use relative references sometimes and when we need to use those absolute references. Of course, if you're not copying and pasting any cells with formulas in them, you really don't need to worry about this. To close out our section on functions, I wanna take a look at maybe one of the most exciting but relatively easy functions you can use in Excel, and that's VLOOKUP. So I wanna go through an example. Imagine that for some terrible reason, your professor or your teacher decided that instead of posting grades to Canvas or Moodle or whatever learning system you use, instead, they're gonna print out everyone's name and everyone's grades on all of the tests, and they're gonna post it outside of their office. Now, this would break a lot of rules, so this would never happen, but let's just for a moment imagine that it did. To find out your test scores in your final grade, you'd have to go to your professor's office. You'd have to find your name and your score for that specific course. So you'd go up to the bulletin board and start looking for your name, running your finger from the top to bottom in the leftmost column. Once you find your name, you would move your eyes or your finger to the right to see your scores. So you would have to figure out how many columns to go to the right to get to test three, test four, and to get to your final grade. Another example of this is, this looks scary, we'll get to it in a second. Think about when you go to your favorite coffee shop. When you go to your favorite coffee shop and you look at the menu, on the far left-hand side are the name of all of your favorite drinks. So maybe your favorite drink is a latte, vanilla latte. So you find vanilla latte by scanning down the left side. Once you find it, then you scan across to find the size you want, small, medium, large. Once you find the size that you want, then you can grab the price, $2.45. This is how VLOOKUP works. 
And I know you might've been staring at this syntax, which looks kind of scary. It looks like there's a lot of letters in here, but it's really just four inputs or arguments. And I'm gonna walk you through what each one is. It's not so bad. The first argument or input is the lookup value. This is the lookup value we're trying to find in the leftmost column of the table. So in the first example of the bulletin board, it would be our name. In the coffee shop example, it would be the name of your favorite drink. The second input is table array. This is the table array in which we're looking for the value. So this would be that entire sheet of paper with all of the scores for everyone on it, or it would be the entire menu at the coffee shop. The next input is the column index number. This is the column index number from which we want to fetch the matching value. So we'll need to count from left to right to see which column we want Excel to stop in. Finally, the last input is the range lookup. Now this seems like we have to do with something special, but really you only have two options for the last input, the word false or the word true. I would say 99% of the time we're gonna use false because that gives us an exact match. You can use true to give an approximate match, but for our examples today, we are gonna use false. So let's take a moment to go to the VLOOKUP tab on our workbook, and we're gonna try and pull Brad's math score. So when I look at the VLOOKUP sheet, I have this table of scores. And because this is a small table, we can very clearly see that Brad's math score is 82. But what we want to see is if we can get Excel to call that value. And this becomes really important when we have much bigger sets of data. No one would want to search through everything to find a certain value they need. Instead, they would use the lookup. There are also times where you don't have access to a raw table like this. And instead, you have to you know, rely on the formulas to pull the value you need. So our goal is going to be to pull Brad's math score. So I just type Brad, and I'm actually going to put just Brad into cell G2. And I'm going to put math score into uh, cell H2, and that's just so I can keep track of what I'm doing. So let's start. Equals VLOOKUP, open parentheses. The first is my lookup value. That's Brad, because Brad, those names, that's what the, what's in that left-hand column. So I'm gonna type Brad in quotes. Just like we typed the less than zero, greater than zero in quotes, we do the same thing here for Brad. Comma, table array. This is the entire table with all of the data I'm looking at. So I'm gonna start in cell A1 and I'm gonna go all the way over to E10. The next is column index number. I need to tell Excel, starting with column one on the far left, what column do I want to stop at? So I want the math score. So that would be column one, column two. So I'm gonna put a two for column index number. And then finally, the last input, that range lookup, that'll just be false so that we get an exact match. I'll close parentheses, I'll press enter and hope that I get 82, and indeed I do. So what Excel does is it looks down the left-hand side for Brad. Once it finds Brad, it goes over, starting with this first column, it goes over to the second column and returns the match. So if instead of typing, wow, look at that. Oh, they typed in Matt and pulled Matt's math score. Type in Bob, we pull Bob's. So this is kind of like that Switzerland example, right? So this is what we need to do. In our function, instead of calling Brad in quotes, let's make our lookup value the cell G2 where I typed Brad earlier. It's still giving me 82. But now if I type in cell G2, Bob, it will pull Bob's math score, Jenny, Jill, and whatever else. So we can use those cell references to make this more powerful. And just so that you know, this is the very beginning of Google. Think about it. 
you type in something that you want to find, and then Google gives you a bunch of outputs. This is much more simplistic, right? We type in our input, Jill, and it gives us an output. It's only one output, and it's you know not very customizable yet, but this is the very beginnings of that. So I want you to take a minute, see if you can get, let's do Maria's chemistry score. So pause the video, see if you can pull Maria's chemistry score. Here we go. Equals V lookup. I'm gonna type, I'm gonna click on cell G7. You could put Maria in quotes if you want. Comma, table array, A1 to E10. Comma, chemistry. What column number is chemistry in? One, two, three. It's in column four. So I'll put a four. And then the last input is false. And we get 80. And that is correct. So I want you to pause, take a minute. Um, it's actually exercise three and four in your workbook. And they have a little box outlined in red that tells you what to do. So exercise three gives you the exact steps from start to finish of what to do. And then exercise four is a little bit more vague. It kind of wants you to problem solve and think through it. So pause the video, see if you can complete exercises three and four. For exercise three, Step one, write equals VLOOKUP open parentheses in F3. So equals VLOOKUP open parentheses. The first argument is what you're looking for. In this case, it's the name in cell F2. So I'll put F2, comma. The table array argument here is the entire data set. So write A colon C. Now I could go and select only the exact cells all the way down to 55. But you can also just select the entire column. That's okay. So A to C. You could also do A1 to C55. That's the entire table as well. Whichever one you feel most comfortable with. Comma. The column index number should be the third column in the data set. One, two, three. So I'll put a three. And then my last argument, because we're looking for the exact match, we'll put false. I'll press enter and I should get 74,243. If we find Brian, indeed we do see 74,243. Now let's take a look at exercise four. Our job is to use VLOOKUP to return the salary of the employee with ID 1030. So first this should be employee ID, right? So let's type 1030 into our employee ID box and let's follow the same process as our example two, or exercise three. So I'll type equals VLOOKUP and I'm in cell K3 right now, lookup value. That's gonna be the employee ID that I have in cell K3 or K2, apologies, comma, table array. That's my entire table. My table spans from column A to column H. So I can put A colon H, comma, column index number. I wanna return salary, so I need to figure out what number column salary is in. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I'll put in eight. And then finally, the range lookup is again false. I'll press enter and you should get 64,717. Finally, as a to end of this section, we have something called HLOOKUP. HLOOKUP is almost the same, but here's the difference. VLOOKUP, scans the left column for the lookup value, then scans to the right. HLOOKUP 
looks for the lookup value in the top row, then scans down. So let's change this. This is looks for the lookup value in the left column. So there you go, there's the difference. VLOOKUP looks for the lookup value in the left column and then scans to the right. So it scans through the columns or the vertical. And then HLOOKUP looks for the lookup value in the top row and then scans down in the rows. Our syntax is exactly the same, except instead of a column index number, it's a row index number. So let's take a moment. We're trying to pull the temperature of Casablanca inside of cell C6. So equals H lookup. Now in this first row here, we're gonna be looking for Casablanca, which is in C5. Our table array is from B2 all the way across to L3. And you can use your mouse or you can use your keyboard. I just held down the shift key while using my arrow keys. Comma. Now my row index number. If I'm trying to pull temperature, what row is that in of this table array? It's in row two, so I'll put a two. And then just like before, my last argument will be false. When I press enter, I get 55, which is indeed the temperature in Casablanca. So let me go ahead and pull this for you so you can see. So there's my H up look, H lookup function. The idea here was really just to get you introduced to these things. You know, go on Google, search for, you know, opportunities or examples using the lookup, H lookup, and just try a bunch of things. The more you practice, the better you'll get. For our last section, we're gonna go through dashboards. So at the very beginning, I told you where we were headed, which is dashboards. So we've gone through pivot tables, pivot charts, some basic formulas and functions, and then some more advanced formulas and functions. Now we're gonna pivot back to dashboards, which are visualizations. So when you hear the word dashboard, what do you think of automatically? Most people say a car. In your car, you have your dashboard, and it gives you an at-a-glance view of how your car is doing, how fast you're traveling, how much gas you have, your wheels rotations per minute, how many miles you have on your car, maybe your oil change light is on so you know that you need to change the oil, and any other alerts will be there as well. So at any point in time, you can look at that dashboard and get a really good idea of how your car is doing and performing. The same thing is true about a dashboard in Excel. Dashboards are just visual interfaces that provide at-a-glance views into key measures relevant to a particular objective or business process. Dashboards are graphical in nature, so it should be a lot of charts, not a lot of words. And the idea is that we're focusing our attention on key trends, comparisons, and exceptions. On our dashboards, we're only going to display the data that's relevant to the goal. As we talked about with our pivot tables, we don't wanna give our audience so much information that they're overwhelmed or that they have more than they asked for. And finally, our dashboards should contain predefined conclusions that define our analysis. When we make dashboards, it's our job to tell a story. As the creator of the dashboard, you are in charge of that story and the narrative. So be careful. I'm sure that you've seen you know, some news reports that show data in a way that's maybe not the best or that doesn't really tell the full story. So make sure that your dashboard really is telling the full story. So I'm gonna show you a few examples from pretty simple all the way to pretty advanced. So here's a relatively simple dashboard. We can see our expenses throughout quarter one of the year, which is the first three months. Immediately, I can look and see where my spending has increased, where it's decreased, and where it's remained the same. So I have been going out to eat more often. My electricity went up, but I got it back under control in March. My phone and vehicle expenses are pretty constant. 
So as I start to plan for the future and budget for the next quarter of the year, I know that I can budget for those phone and vehicle expenses without fail. But I know that I have a little bit of wiggle room with going out to eat because I've been increasing those expenses over the months. Here's another example. It's not important that you can't really read what it says, but let's just get a general picture of what this is. We see that we have three different charts. We have a line chart, which shows sales data over time. We have sales rep data that shows their sales per salesperson, and then sales across the region. We also have some of these buttons over here on the right, and we'll talk a little bit later about what those are. Here's another dashboard created in Excel. It's a project dashboard that might be used by a program manager or a project manager. It shows burn down, resource allocation, project budget, open and pending actions, and then some sums of risk items for each project. And finally, the dashboard that we started looking at, this really tells a complete story. Now, depending on who the audience is, this may be too much information. But the person that created this dashboard certainly had the audience in mind and made sure that everything here was relevant to what they would need. So we won't create anything this complex today, but we'll certainly set you on the right path to get here. When preparing for a dashboard project, it's always important to consider several points. The first is to establish an audience and a purpose for the dashboard. Think about the source of the data and the end users. Will the data be used as a performance tool? Will it be shared with external customers? These things all go into and help influence what you put on your dashboard. So we're actually gonna go back to what we started with, which is our bank data. We're gonna create a dashboard here. So off to the side, maybe in column I or so, let's take some notes. Let's decide who the audience will be. There are a lot of different options for this, right? Who might care about bank data? You've got potential customers, potential investors. We've also got regional managers, CEOs, right? So depending on who's asking you to make the dashboard, that would influence your audience. But for our example today, let's set maybe a regional manager as our audience. So maybe I work at the bank and my regional manager says, hey, I'd like you to make me a dashboard. So we have to think about why might the regional manager want the dashboard? There are again, lots of answers to this question. When you're creating dashboards, there's no hard and fast rules about how to do it. It's really about telling that story. So because I know my regional manager, I know that they really are trying to get the performance of the branches. So they wanna know which branch is doing the best, which is doing the worst, where do they need to allocate more resources? So the purpose of this dashboard is to show the performance of each branch. I need to keep that in mind. Once you have your audience and purpose, the next step is to delineate the measures for the dashboard. Ask yourself, what are the key performance indicators or KPIs? KPI is really just an indicator of the performance of a task that's essential to daily operations or processes. KPIs help us reveal performance that is outside the normal range for a particular measure. So when I think about my key performance indicators, I need to answer the question, well, how do I know how each branch is doing? When I look at this data here, the things that pop out to me are the amount of money going into the accounts and the number of accounts being opened, right? The more money going into the bank, the more accounts being opened at the bank, I would say the better the branch is doing. So those two values, the sum and the count, remember we talked about the difference between those at the beginning of our session, those are really what's gonna be driving our KPIs and our data here. The third consideration really doesn't apply to this workshop today, but as you create dashboards in an internship or in life later, you'll have to think about cataloging required data sources. 
do you have access to all the necessary data you need? How often are those data sources refreshed? Who owns and maintains those data sources? And what are the processes to get the data from those resources? Data is dynamic, so it's always changing, always adding. So how often can you get that information? The fourth consideration is to define the dimensions and filters for the dashboard. All the dimension is is a data is a data category that we're going to use to organize our business data across the dashboard. The dimension should always relate directly back to our purpose. So if our purpose is to show the performance of each branch, then my dimension or what I'm going to use to organize my data should be by branch. If my purpose was something about the different account types, then I would use account type as my main dimension. Filters are mechanisms that allow us to narrow the scope of the data to a single dimension. So basically anything that we haven't already used as a KPI or the dimension can become a filter. So we might use customer as a filter. We might use opened by as a filter, account type or weekday. We have to kind of decide what to use for our filters as we make our dashboard. Those are possibilities. These last two considerations, again, don't apply for this workshop, but definitely something you should put in your toolkit. First is to determine the need for drill down features. Depending on who your audience is, they may want the ability to get a raw data table supporting the measures that we show on our dashboard. So always think about, do I need to show my raw data to my audience or not? And then the final consideration is to establish the refresh schedule for the dashboard itself. The refresh schedule is just the schedule by which the dashboard, dashboard is updated to show the latest information available. Keep in mind the refresh rates of the data source as well as the time for data migration. Adding new data to a dashboard is always time consuming, so make sure that your refresh schedule takes that into account. I want us to just reflect back to these questions we answered earlier. We used pivot tables to answer these questions, and we're gonna to continue to use pivot tables as we create our dashboard. Here is a best practice. When we're creating dashboards, we should have three separate layers. The first is our raw data layer. We already have that, it's our bank data sheet here. The second layer is our analysis layer. This consists of formulas that will analyze and pull the data from the data layer into staging tables. And these are just our pivot tables. The analysis layer is where we summarize and shape our data to feed our dashboard layer. The third and final layer is the presentation layer. This is the dashboard. It contains charts, conditional formatting, and other visualizations, and it's the final product I'll share with my audience. So let's go ahead and create our analysis and presentation layer right now. So in my workbook, I'm going to add a sheet, and I'm going to right-click that sheet and rename it Bank Analysis. And I'll create one more sheet, and I'm going to call it Bank Dashboard. Oops. Right click, rename, Bank Dashboard. All right, and these notes that I took on my bank data, I'm going to actually cut those, Command or Control X, and I'm going to paste them onto my bank analysis sheet just so that I keep my data clean. We'll look at the design practices in a minute, but let's go ahead and start building our pivot tables. So just as we did before, I'll go back to my bank data sheet and I'm gonna insert a pivot table. Insert pivot table. I'm gonna add it to an existing worksheet, which is my bank analysis layer. Because my dimension is branch, I'm always gonna put that in rows. I need to break down all of my pivot tables across branches. 
For my first pivot table, I'll use the first KPI, the amount of money going into those accounts. So I'm gonna take amount and I'm gonna drag it to values and get a sum. And this is okay, this is a pretty simple pivot table, but this gives me some information and allows me to tell my regional manager immediately which branch is doing the best and which is doing the worst in terms of the amount of money going into the accounts. So let's create a pivot chart to go with this. I've clicked inside of my pivot table. I will insert, and I'm gonna use a pie chart. I'll rename this. This is the amount in accounts by branch. One thing I wanna let you know is that we should add data labels. We'll do that in a minute. We'll get there. So there's my first table and chart. Don't worry about making it look pretty or having things laid out. We're gonna move everything anyway. So let's create a second pivot chart and pivot table. So I'll go back to bank data. I'll insert a new pivot table on an existing worksheet, my bank analysis sheet. And I wanna, maybe I need to move this out of the way. Okay, and I'm gonna now create my second KPI. So I'm gonna use branch and the count of amount. So branch goes into rows, count of amount, goes into values. And I'll insert another pie chart. So this is the number of accounts by branch. All right, maybe I want one more pivot table. There is really no limit to the number of charts and pivot tables you can or should use. Just make sure that it's enough to tell the story. So I'll insert a new pivot table. Oops, let's go back to bank data. We'll insert a pivot table and place it on an existing worksheet, our bank analysis sheet. So this time I think I wanna break it down by branch, of course, and maybe account type. And maybe I wanna do a count. Again, there are no hard and fast rules. You're just looking and saying, how can I best tell the story? Because this is a kind of a two-way table, I don't wanna use a pie chart. Instead, I'm gonna use a column chart. This is a pretty good story that we're telling, right? We can see that Essential has by and far the most accounts and that it has proportionally more checking accounts than any other branch. So let's add a title here. So when you have your, uh, actually we'll do that in a second. We'll add the title, don't worry. All right, so we have three charts. That's a good start to our dashboard. So what we need to do is move these three charts to our bank dashboard. You can cut and paste them, I like to use the move chart option though. So I'm gonna right click on one of my charts and find the option that says move chart. And I'm gonna move it so that it's an object in my bank dashboard. I'll click okay, and now it's moved. I'll go bank to my, back to my bank analysis sheet and I'll do the same for my other two charts. So I'll right click my chart, move chart, move it to be an object in my bank dashboard sheet. I'll go back to bank analysis and I'll do the same for my last chart. Right click, move chart, object in bank dashboard. All right, so now I have my three charts. I can kind of start organizing them. And as we start organizing, let's think about some design best practices. The first is to keep it simple. We don't want too much information, so much so that my report looks busy. We don't want to include as much information as possible, only what's needed for the core purpose. We should avoid too much fancy formatting. Although it's good for marketing, it often makes the data more difficult to read. Make sure that you're emphasizing the data and de-emphasizing everything else. We do want to limit our dashboards to one page. 
Dash bars are meant to be at a glance views into key measures, so we shouldn't have to scroll a whole lot to see everything. Finally, we do want to make sure that everything is labeled and formatted for easy readability. We should use descriptive titles for each component. So when I said we should add data labels and add titles, that's where I was getting to. So let's go ahead and do all of that right now. So the first thing I'm going to do is kind of move these things around so that they're roughly the same size. So right now, this one chart and I'm leaving some space on the left-hand side intentionally. I'm leaving columns A and B empty. And I'm also gonna leave rows one and two empty. So this first chart is spanning one, two, three, four columns. So I'll make my second chart span four columns as well. All right, and then I'm gonna put my third chart down below. I don't like to leave a lot of white space on my dashboards because I like it to be as concise as possible. So a couple of things we need to do. Let's add a title to this bottom chart. So when you click on the chart, you'll have some contextual tabs pop up on your ribbon. Find the design tab. On the far left hand side, there's an option to add a chart element. We're going to add a chart title above the chart. So this is the number of each account type broken down by branch. Okay, maybe we want some data labels on these pie charts. So on that same design tab in the same add chart element drop down, we can add data labels. You can add them in the center. You can add them in the inside end. Maybe you want to do call out. This data call out is pretty cool. It gives you like this little uh, speech bubble that points to each section and gives you the percent. I like to do this sometimes. But because we have that kind of call out pointing to each with the category name, we don't really need this legend anymore. So I'm going to click on it and delete it. Makes it look a little cleaner. I'll do the same for this other pie chart. Data labels, data call out, and I'll delete my legend. You don't have to make it look exactly like this. You'll start to find your own style when making dashboards. Maybe the next thing I wanna do is add a title to my dashboard. So I'm gonna insert a text box. On your ribbon, go to the insert tab. On the far right-hand side, you should see an option in the text group for a text box. Once you click on the text box option, you can click and drag to make your text box above your dashboard. Maybe I'll call this performance by branch. Maybe I want to center it, make it a little bigger. Okay, and you generally do want to make sure things are lined up. All right. If it bothers you that things aren't exactly lined up, you can click on your charts and go to format and you can change the exact height and width of everything. So you can play around with it until you get it exactly as you want it. I will say that the first iteration of your dashboard is usually not the last, right? It always changes throughout. All right, that looks okay for now. It's still not even, but you get the idea. So this is a pretty good view into how each branch is doing, right? We can easily see that central branch is outperforming the other two branches and that all of the account types are outperforming IRA accounts and savings accounts. The last thing I wanna show you how to do before we end is how to add a slicer to your dashboard. Slicers are essentially interactive filters. And this is where we start getting into some powerful stuff in dashboarding. So to insert a slicer, we're gonna click anywhere in the pivot chart. We're putting them on the dashboard, so we are gonna use the pivot chart. On the ribbon, we're going to go to the insert tab and then choose the slicer command. Once we do that, it'll pull up a dialog box. We'll be able to check the boxes for the fields we wanna display as slicers or filters, and then we'll select okay. So let's do that now. 
I'll select any one of my three charts on my dashboard. On my ribbon, I'll go to the Insert tab, and then I'm gonna look for the command that says Slicer. It's in the Filters group next to Timeline. When you click the Slicer command, it pulls up this dialog box and asks you to check which kind of slicers or filters you want. Now we set a bunch of filters earlier. You can use all of them or maybe just a few, depending on what you want to tell as a part of your story. So I think it would be interesting to be able to filter by weekday and maybe by customer type. Maybe I wanna see if there's a difference between new and existing customers. So I'll click okay. And it pulls up these two slicer boxes. And this is why I left that empty space on the left. So I'm gonna pull these over here, resize. Again, feel free to play around. You don't have to get it perfect the first time. Maybe you wanna make this a little smaller and center these a little more. To select both of them at once, I just held down the shift key as I clicked on them. Okay, so now watch this. If I click on a day of the week, this chart is changing to reflect only that day of the week. The same thing with my customer. If you wanna select multiple entries, just click the multi-select button here, and then it'll allow you to select multiple days of the week. If you wanna clear the filter, just press the clear filter option. Now notice that it was only changing the first chart that I had it connected to. In an ideal world, we would want it connected to all of our charts, so that all of them would change at once and allow us to get really quick views into each of our different filters. So we're going to connect each slicer to each of our charts. To do that, click on your slicer, and then on the ribbon, we'll go to the slicer tab and find the report connections button. So I'll click on my slicer. On your ribbon, you see the slicer tab. This is where you can change the color and format of your slicer. Again, keeping in mind, you know, usability and ease. And then there's a report connections button. I'm gonna click that report connections button. In the box that pops up, you'll see all of the pivot tables on your workbook. I know that I wanna connect this to the pivot tables that were on that bank analysis sheet. So I'll select those check boxes. I'll click okay. And let's do the same for our other slicer. I'll click on the slicer, make sure I'm on the slicer tab. I'm gonna change it so that it's the same format. And then I'll click report connections and make sure that I have all of my pivot tables on my bank analysis sheet connected. I'll click okay. So now let's take a look at what happens when I click on one of my days of the week. When I click on Friday, all three charts change at once. So already I can see, okay, on Fridays, existing customers aren't opening any accounts, any IRA accounts at North County. Maybe that's an issue in somewhere that I can put resources. So this was really just an introduction to dashboards. This is a relatively simple dashboard. As you work, you'll get to know your style. You'll get to know how to tell stories in the best way. As a last piece of this, I'd like you to take some time to create a dashboard based on this pivot exercise. Your dashboard should tell a story, identify the audience and purpose. Be sure to follow best practices. Know that there isn't one right way, but there are better ways to tell stories, right? I'm sure you've heard someone tell a story that was very boring, but the content itself was really good. And if they had just told it in a more riveting way, then you would have enjoyed it. And it's the same with dashboards. It's up to you to make sure that your audience is engaged and that they're able to get to the conclusions you want them to get to. For your mini project, 
here is the task. You'll choose one of the four datasets at bit.ly slash FAMU datasets. There's a QR code here you can also use to get to the datasets. On each dataset, depending on which one you pick, there are accompanying questions. They're located to the right of the dataset. And this is really to allow you to start exploring, kind of like we did with the bank data. We gave you some questions, we created pivot tables to answer those questions. Part two is to create a dashboard containing pivot tables, pivot charts, and slicers to showcase the data and trends. It's up to you to dig into the data to figure out what you want to show and what story you want to tell. Completion of the dashboard and the presentation that will take place in November will be the assessment for you to receive your micro-credential that you can add to your LinkedIn profile to really showcase and highlight your talents and your new skills that you've gained. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me at schuler su at techbridge.org. Thanks for your attention. I hope you learned a lot. Feel free to let me know if you have any questions or concerns. Thanks.